welcome to Women Business Owners Alliance, Learn from the Experts. And today we're going to talk about employment law. And to, with us today is? Jennifer Rymarski from Morrison Mahoney. And you're a lawyer. I am. And tell me exactly what you do with business law. I help uh, professionals navigate through complex legal matters, either proactively or reactively. And you're working a lot with employer benefit, employee benefits and what you should do to keep your employees happy, maybe? Yes, that's correct. Um, I primarily work for employers, so I help them, so as I said, navigate through many of the complex legal um, ramifications that there are for having employees. And uh, my goal is to try to get them to work proactively and think about their employees proactively, uh, but also assist them when uh, a litigation uh, unfortunately results. And so what is the biggest thing that employers should need to know about um, their employees? Well, there's lots of things that an employer should be worried about or concerned about. Uh, I think the most important thing is determining what kind of business you're going to be. And that is uh, with respect to their corporate structure. Uh, is the employer going to be working for themselves? Uh, are they going to have employees? How are they going to classify those employees? And if they uh, are not working for themselves, should they be forming a business entity such as an LLC or an Inc. or uh, an LLP that would employ other people? As a uh, small business owner, that right at the moment is a sole proprietor and they're thinking about hiring someone. Are there a lot of rules and regulations they need to know about to hire just one person? Yes, absolutely. Uh, it's determining whether or not this person is going to actually be an employee or an agent of uh, the other and whether or not that person is going to be uh, a W-2 employee meaning the company will issue them just a salary and take out their taxes versus uh, an independent contractor, whereas they would get a 1099 and then the individual um, worker would then have to report all their taxes and pay their taxes on their own. So if they're an employee, um, I read uh, at will or contractual, what's the difference between that? Right, so an at will employee can be terminated for any cause or no cause at all. Uh, for any reason, of course, setting aside not being fired for any sort of discriminatory reason. Uh, a contracted employee is, just as the phrase uh, defines, that they have a contract that defines the scope and the terms of their employment. So in other words, the, the um, employee actually signs a gre an agreement that outlines what their duties and responsibilities are, how long, for example, they may be an employee of the employer, uh, what are their benefits they're going to receive, and what is the scope of their work. So that person can't get fired? That's not to say that that person can't get fired. The contract itself could have um, outlined any number of reasons why a termination could occur, uh, either voluntarily or involuntarily. So what, is, what specifically makes an at-will person that can be hired and fired at no cost? Essentially having no contract. No contract. So if I just hire someone and don't do a contract with them, they're considered an at-will um, person. Employee. Employee. Correct. Okay. Yes. <laughs> All right. And that assumes, um, getting to your question earlier about the independent contractor versus the employee, if the employer exercises um, enough control over a a worker, um, such as setting their schedule, controlling where they're going and where they're not going. Um, there are certain factors that would make them actually fall into an employee category versus an independent contractor who is sort of just providing a service to the employer. For the employer, looking at who should I hire, should I hire a contractor or should I hire an employee, the difference would be in uh, my tax filings that I have to do related to each of those people. Is that, that correct? That's one important piece, yes. And you have to have unemployment insurance on an at-will person. Do you have to have un unemployment, pay for unemployment insurance on a contracted person? On an independent contractor, they would be responsible for maintaining their own insurance. What about what I want them to do? Should I have, if I hire, 
three employees, should I have a handbook and what should I put in that handbook to tell them their responsibilities? Sure, I think that's one of the proactive things that an employer can do. Uh, it benefits both the employer and the employee by having a, a, a rule book, for example, or a policy um, so that the employer can set forth what their expectations are and the employee also knows what their responsibilities are and also any parameters of their employment um, such as smoking, use of emails, um, use of sick time, vacation time. There's a whole host of sort of employee benefits that should be outlined in an employee handbook. Um, progressive discipline, for example, or the disciplinary policy is another important aspect of an employee handbook. So as a small business owner, and I need, I need to help, I need to hire some people, what, um, what kind of guidelines should I be thinking about? Do, do the, um, are there guidelines out there that I have, things that I have to do for an employee as opposed to I'm just gonna hire you and let's make up some rules as we go along? Sure, it depends um, you know, how big your organization is, but for smaller companies, um, you do want to consider how many hours your employees are going to work because that would trigger possibly what benefits you need to offer them, such as health care, for example. Uh, that would be an important aspect of a small business consideration. Um, again, that issue of what duties and responsibilities the employee is going to have and does that person act as your agent as an employee versus an independent contractor is another consideration. Um, you know, for a small business that's just starting, they might need somebody not necessarily to be an employee, but need to, they would prefer a contractor because the employer is just starting to develop their own business, but then they want to sub out certain work such as IT or computer work or marketing before that company grows to a point where it can then start bringing those people in-house. So for a small business, I'd recommend you know, getting into a contractual agreement with some vendors, um, which is something I could also help with as an attorney, looking at those contracts, making sure that the employer is protected if they enter into these sort of vendor agreements. So when is the line between I'm working for you and doing all this work for you, uh, but I'm, I'm only a, a self-employed person myself as opposed to becoming employed to you. Where is that fine line of knowing that what I'm hiring someone for is not really being their employer, just getting their services? Mm -hmm. Well, I think it, it really depends on what you're looking for. If you have uh, the goal of having somebody come on board and assist you, even if you're just one person, but then you decide that you need some help and this employee or prospective person is going to do, be acting as your agent, meaning they're going to be going out soliciting business for you, um, meeting with people, binding you in terms of contracts, for example, then that person is probably going to be considered an employee and that person um, should have some clearly defined goals. So as if I hire someone as an employee, but I'm getting them to do, bring business into the, into the company and paying them on commissions for what they bring in, do I still have to pay them an employee salary or can I just pay them commi commissions? Um, you're free to contract and, and if the putative person that you're thinking about for your work um, is agreeable to being an independent contractor, uh, there can be an agreement that outlines that relationship as well and makes it clear that both parties are having a meeting of the minds, whereas um, the employer, employee is signing an agreement acknowledging that, for example, they are going to be considered an independent contractor, not specifically an employee, that they will get a 1099 and that they are not bound by sort of the schedule and rubric that you would generally impose of an employee. At the same time, the employer gets the protection of having that same contract outline all of those things so the parties have met, uh, have, have that meeting of the minds, if you will, that that's the sort of relationship that they're going to have versus an employee. And it's really good to get it in writing. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. 
It's amazing. Even small businesses need something in writing, you know, getting back to the handbook about policies or procedures. Um, I think the, the better proactive approach is to have a set, set of guidelines or a handbook to follow so that the expectations are clear. So if you haven't hired an employee yet in your new business and you want to hire an employee, what's the first thing you should do? I think the first thing that I would recommend a small business owner do is to outline what they want this person to do. What are the expectations? Um, what can they afford to pay this person? Um, would it be more beneficial if this person did take on the burden of their paying their own taxes versus um, could the company or the employer, do, do they have the capacity and the resources to hire that, that individual as a full-time or part-time worker? Okay, one last question. As a small business owner, what are ways that we can get in trouble if we don't do the right thing? Sure. Um, I think liability is on, should be on every new um, uh, or emerging small business owner's mind. Uh, what are my risks to the business I'm going to be engaging in? And that risk can engage to everything from, am I going to be serving the public? For example, if you're starting a catering company, getting to know what your requirements are by your local board of health, and then, you know, what insurance do I need? You know, for example, if someone were to um, get food poisoning from your food, or you know, have an unfortunate sickness as a result of something that they ate for your business, um, that would be one example. Um, you know, other liabilities would include if you are. Um, you yourself have a business that goes into other people's properties, um, what that would mean for you. So I think ha talking to an insurance agent would be on the top uh, three things I would recommend for a small business owner, just generally about what their business is going to do. Um, on the employer, employee side, as I said, determining what their needs are, determining um, how they're going to interact with their employees or their independent contractors. Um, from the perspective of proactors versus reactive, um, certainly a small business owner is subjected to um, discrimination laws. So certainly we want to be sure as a business owner uh, that they are prepared and they have proper procedures in place to, accom to make accommodations for employees, um, to not discriminate against employees, and also um, have procedures and policies and safeguards in place in the event that uh, an employee needs to be terminated uh, so they can avoid a lawsuit. Okay, you've been great. Um, our time is up. If you have any questions and you want to talk to Jennifer Moore, Attorney Jennifer, <laughs> uh, uh, you can look her up on our WBOA website and look for um, who, what, who are we on our WBOA website and we have a member directory in there and you can find her in there. Thank you. You're welcome.